the history of Wade Park doesn't start actually with the Wade family. It certainly doesn't start with the buildings that we see around us. The real history of Wade Park goes back millions of years. You see, the land that we stand upon here is born of the sediments of ancient seas piled up over millions of millions of years, a vast Devonian ocean that accumulated vast shales and sandstones that lie below our feet. What we don't see in University Circle is the natural landscape that originally attracted people to settlement here. And, and it's, it's worth trying to look at that landscape uh, historically, and, and I think when people walk around the circle today, I think it's worth their while to try to see the remnants of that landscape because they're still here. But what really molded the landscape that we're familiar with today in the Wade Oval area and throughout the Cleveland area was the glaciers. Starting with the Pleistocene era, about a million and a half years ago, there were these giant lobes of glaciers moving across the landscape like bulldozers, pushing debris further and further south, filling in the low places, scouring off the, the top, top places, and basically giving us the soil structure and much of the familiar topography that we see in Cleveland today. The Donebrook watershed, uh, Donebrook, which starts up in Shaker Heights and which finds its way to Lake Erie, was one of the major streams to the eastern part of Cleveland when the area was first settled. So that, that's one component of this puzzle. The, the other part is, is the ridge line, the old shore of Lake Erie, which formed the heights. Uh, most visibly from University Circle, one would see Cleveland Heights. And so you have this old ridge, ridge line, uh, ancient prehistoric ridge line, and you have this, this valley. And, and they determine settlements. These are black oak leaves and some of the largest tree trunks you see behind me here are black oak trees. And the black oak is a type of oak that likes sand barrens. It likes to grow in well-drained soils, sandy soils. And about the only place we find them in northeastern Ohio are on these old ancestral shorelines to the glacial ancestors of Lake Erie. And so it's kind of interesting that even to this day, these huge black oaks are markers of the prehistory of Wade Oval. If you were here a couple hundred years ago, about the time of the founding of the city of Cleveland, you'd have a, a variety of habitats, and in these habitats, there was an awful lot of very intriguing wildlife. It turns out that you could have found black bear living in what is now Wade Park. You could have found uh, American elk. You would have found bison. If you're looking at the natural landscape, and, and the history of the natural landscape, you, you have to understand that there had been population here for 10,000 years. And, and that population was a Native American population. These glacial uh, sand deposits that formed Wade Oval and, and other areas like it would have actually been the ancient highways that the Native Americans would have used because these raised sandy dunes from the ancestors of Lake Erie, would have had sparse vegetation, except for these back oak, and it would have been easy for these Native Americans to move back and forth from hunting area to, to hunting area. In 1662, King Charles of England granted his colonial subjects the land that would become the state of Connecticut, including its Western Reserve, a territory that we now call Northeast Ohio. Soon after the United States Constitution was ratified, the state of Connecticut chartered the Connecticut Land Company to sell off the state's Western Reserve holdings. In 1796, Moses Cleveland led a surveying party to the mouth of the Cuyahoga River and began the process of mapping the capital city of the Reserve, a city that was to bear his name. Cleveland is uh, established, if you will, as a small settlement in 1796. It doesn't prosper. It's, uh, it's pretty much a failure. But to the east of Cleveland, uh, in an area that would become known as Doan's Corners. In 1799, a man named Nathaniel Doan sets up a small settlement. It is on the main road to Buffalo, the main coach road that will develop between Cleveland and Buffalo in the east. And it's also at a ford, it's a small stream at which you had to stop. It was a great place to set up a business. And, and actually, Doan's Corners grows more rapidly than the city of Cleveland. It is near the ridge line, and the ridge line allows for travel to the other growing community in early, 18, early 19th century Cleveland, which is Newburgh. 
Broadway and Harvard. So today, if somebody's driving along Woodhill Road and East 93rd Street, they're following that route from Doan's Corners to Newburgh. Over the course of the 1800s, it was quickly settled. And the changes that we saw in the landscape initially were basically felling all of the forests to create open fields and open environments for agriculture. There are a lot more trees that we see in University Circle today in the 21st century than we would have seen at the start of the 20th century 100 years ago. By the 1830s and 40s and 50s, you have a number of migrant families, the Fords, the Kozads, the Bates, who come out to uh, this section of what is known as East Cleveland, and, and, and they farm here. From the Journal of Horatio Ford, quote, the orchard was the loved outdoor room, ever-changing and ever-friendly, a clover, buttercuped, romping place for childhood, a dreaming place for youth, stretched upward in the tall, soft orchard grass. Samuel Cozad was one of the very early settlers, and his family married into the Ford family, but he came out here in 1806, and probably the oldest surviving artifact in the circle is the top grindstone of two stones. He erected a grist mill. The families who settled Doan's Corners were farmers and devout Protestants. The Cozads settled on land that eventually became the site of the Cleveland Museum of Art, Severance Hall, and the northern campus of Case Western Reserve University. The Fords acquired farmland that is now University Hospitals, Little Italy, and the southern campus of the university. The grandson of Samuel Cozad inherited the land, which is where most of University Circle and Wade Park is today. He saw the fact that it was not good farmland, this, the, where the museum particularly and the, and the main park. Mr. Cozad was one of the first people to envision establishing a park. Uh, I think what he wanted to do was to be certain that the beauty that, that he had found here would, would live on after him. The idea of a park to preserve the beauty of this piece of land sparked the imagination of people over several generations, eventually leading to what we now know as University Circle. And he took out a mortgage on his ownership and <laughs> hired a, an urban landscaper from Cincinnati who came up and laid out a park. By the 1850s, the families of Doan's Corners became involved with abolitionist activities, such as the Underground Railroad, housing fugitive slaves on their isolated farms, and then transporting them by hay wagon to the last station on the railroad, a barber shop on Lake Erie's shores, and then by boat across the lake to Canada and freedom. We do have independent, at least four different accounts that validate the fact that the Cozads and the Fords uh, housed the fugitive slaves, which was somewhat of a dangerous uh, undertaking because there was the uh, Fugitive Slave Act. The Doan Brook being something that was much more prominent and hard to ford was your barrier of, of keeping this area safe for housing the slaves temporarily because of the, 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 the bounty was, hunters coming from the Cleveland. Place, it was they an could, isolated, it was an isolated well, area. It, well, and it was, yeah, it was away from downtown, Town. four miles away. One property remains in University Circle to recall the neighborhood's agricultural and abolitionist history. The Cozad Farmhouse, built in 1854, is situated behind the larger and more ornate Cozad Bates House that was built in 1875 and is located at the corner of Mayfield Avenue and East 115th Street. The house that still strikes me in, in this neighborhood is, is the Cozad Bates House because it's a survivor. And, and the back part of, of that house possibly was used to hold slaves who were coming north to Cleveland on the Underground Railroad. So that structure is a real reminder not only of the farm community, but of the fact that, that there was a strong antipathy towards slavery. The next impetus in changing it from a sort of a pastoral agricultural community to what it has become now occurs after the American Civil War. And there was a lot of money to be made in Cleveland during the war. Uh, Cleveland, according to Chris Field Johnson, uh, the historian, 
started the war as a sleepy merchant, mercantile community and, and left the war as a nascent industrial community. Uh, Cleveland itself went from 45,000 to 65,000 people in those five years. People who had been entrepreneurs, to use the contemporary term, became enormously wealthy. Jeff the Homer Wade, the founder of Western Union Telegraphy. Uh, Wade became wealthy because the telegraph was the primary means of communication in the war. Amos Stone, who built railroads, became wealthy. The Devereux family became wealthy. And chief of all, John D. Rockefeller, who starts the war as a uh, young commodities merchant, uh, selling goods, uh, and gets into a new commodity in 1863 oil. In the decades that followed the Civil War, the city experienced dramatic changes fueled by rapid industrialization. Farms and fields gave way to factories, mansions, and tenements. As fortunes were made, and immigrants flooded the city to work in the mills, the docks, and the railroads. As Cleveland grows, it becomes smokier and dirtier. And so wealthy people are looking for an escape, and, and their escape is to the east, to the Donebrook Valley. In the 1870s, Joseph Kozad sold his farm, nearly 75 acres east of 105th Street, to Jephthah Homer Wade, founder of the Western Union Telegraph Company. Along came one of the several bank uh, panics, 1873, uh, and he suddenly was land poor and broke and had to sell the property to pay his debts. And I think there were two sales involved until Jephthah Wade came along and actually finally bought it. Jephthah Wade was the founder of the Western Union Telegraph Company. And of course, the telegraph was the was the uh, great technological invention of the 19th century, telegraphs and, and railroads. And he was an investor in both. But before he was uh, a great entrepreneur, he was a portrait painter and a photographer. He developed his interest in art early in life when he took a trip to Europe for more than a year uh, with his parents at the age of uh, 14. He also donated part of his land for the museum site and ceded to the city of Cleveland the land surrounding the museum for a public park. Mr. Wade stated clearly in his deed that his gift of Wade Park was made because he was desirous of, quote, securing to the citizens of Cleveland a beautiful and attractive public park for the benefit of all people, situated near the place where several important institutions of learning are about to be permanently located. Others followed his example, including William Gordon, who gave his 112-acre estate on Lake Erie to the city, and John D. Rockefeller, who gave the city $350,000 in 1896 to improve the land between Wade and Gordon Parks along Dome Brook. This area now is known as Rockefeller Park. Other successful industrialists followed suit and laid the foundations for many of the cultural and educational institutions for which University Circle is known today. In, in the 1880s, the other change that occurs is Amos Stone, who's made money during the war and after the war with railroads convinces Western Reserve College to move from Hudson to the area. That's where university comes in. Very shortly thereafter, his only son, Adelbert, uh, drowned in an accident when he was a student at Yale. So the original college moved up was called, the undergraduate part was called Adelbert College as a result of that. But at the same time, Case was being established as a school to teach technology for the new industrial age. And I think Amos Stone had the idea that if he brought Western Reserve up here, you'd begin to develop a critical mass of higher education that would be good for the, the Cleveland area. You have a wonderful park, you have a burgeoning city to the west, and up on the hillside, you have Mr. Rockefeller's house, a few other small estates, and you have Euclid Avenue sort of moving out and, and changes in the air. Development moves steadily eastward from the city's original boundary at East 55th Street to Doan's Corners and north to Lake Erie. The city annexed the village of East Cleveland, which went from East 55th Street to the boundary of the current city of East Cleveland, Glenville, and Collinwood. These neighborhoods flourished as centers of ethnic and religious settlement. If you move rapidly from the time of the donation of Wade Park to the city to 1882, 
to, let's say, the 1910s, and you look at the region. The university circle began to change. Uh, and and you, you, can, you can dice it economically, you can dice it by ethnicity. And so in 1905, the Wade family still owns land here that is not parkland. And they, they begin to sell it as allotments. Well, we're standing here on Magnolia, which is one of the great streets in, in Cleveland. It was built uh, at the turn of the last century. It was built by people who, whose families often were the ones that uh, had the big houses on, on, on Euclid Avenue. And that gen the next generation decided they didn't want those large mansions and wound up uh, developing the, 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 the Wade Park allotment. When I was an early teenager, maybe, or younger, would be going to my grandmother's house on Magnolia Drive or to my aunt Mrs. Burke's house, which is now the music settlement. Even as a kid, I knew how beautiful it was because all the magnolias were still blooming. It was a great place to live, and there was always something to do. We could, on rainy days, we'd go to the Historical Society, we'd just walk to the art, the museum was free, so we'd go to the art museum, we'd ride over to Lakeview Cemetery and look at all the names on the monuments, and we'd ride through the cultural gardens, and <clears throat> we used to ride down 105th Street, past the temple, and then go down Ansel. On the other side of 105th Street, where the tennis courts are, there's a, a pond, and there, they rented canoes, and there was a boathouse, and in the winter it would freeze and you could go skating. The evolution of the magnificent buildings on Magnolia Drive exemplifies the development of the circle as a whole. Originally rural and residential, this community was repurposed for social, religious, cultural, health, and educational uses. Magnolia became the home of entrepreneurs, industrialists, faculty members, clergy, and bankers. Recognizable names such as S. Livingston Mather, Edmund S. Burke, the Wade family, Thelma and Edward Winter, five generations of the Grease family, and Agnes Gunn either lived on the street or provided the resources to support the conversion of the street for institutional uses. Yet they did so without disrupting the original intent of the Circle's founders to establish a vital neighborhood community in a park-like setting. So they moved out here and they built these remarkable homes. You can see them on Magnolia. You can see, the, you can see some of them on East Boulevard. It's the next version of Euclid Avenue. So it's a really wealthy section. Up the hill you have the Italians, Little Italy has its origins really in the 1880s as Italians come to take jobs in the cemetery, Lakeview Cemetery. So Little Italy grows and its growth is, is catalyzed by the fact that there's something else that has crept into this garden and it's called a railroad. Down the street, if you will, of what is now 105th Street, Domes Corners, which was this little hotel and you know, a blacksmith shop and whatever else, Downs Corners by the early 1900s are becoming a second downtown for Cleveland. There was Bailey's department store, there was a public library, and there was a hat shop, and there was Burroughs, which was a bookstore and, and stationery store, and um, Who Cares ice cream place. In the early days, it was a vibrant happening place. You had jazz clubs up and down 105th in Euclid, Vaudevillian Theater uptown in Euclid. You had restaurants, vital retail. It was the happening place. A walk up Euclid Avenue and you were uptown. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. The earliest and longest running jazz club in the University Circle area was Lindsay Sky Bar, located here on Euclid Avenue between East 105th and 107th Street, behind the Fenway Hall Hotel. By the 1950s, these jazz clubs were bringing in many of the biggest names in jazz. There was an Alhambra Theater, and then there were stairs downstairs, and under the theater was this restaurant that had great food and it was owned by a gangster. And my mother kept saying, I can't believe he's such a nice man. I just don't understand. I can't <laughs> believe that, that he's a gangster. Well, then he, he got wiped out in a mob hit at some point. 105th and Euclid was a very exciting area. I do remember that on a Sunday afternoon, my mother 
used to have my sister and me dress in our little white gloves. We always wore hats and she would take us to the theater and then to Hoffman's for ice cream afterwards. There was uh, the Tasty Shop. We were kosher, so we did not go in there, but we passed by it all the time. But I do remember that there was a hotel nearby. It, it was a busy, busy place. But if you begin to go up 105th Street toward the north, you're into a new neighborhood. That was Glenville. By the early 1900s, it begins to become one of Cleveland's primary Jewish communities. The truth is that in the beginning, Jews were excluded socially, business-wise, and uh, community-wise also. So they formed their own little enclaves. And, and so the Jewish community then iterates itself. It, it becomes visible in University Circle by the 1910s and 1920s, where at Mount Sinai Hospital and at the Temple to Fareth Israel. There was no place really for Jewish young doctors in the general hospitals in our community because of some type of quota system that would not permit a large number of doctors. So as happened in many other communities, Mount Sinai was formed to accommodate the Jewish doctors. So this is sort of the, the southern end of a Jewish community that stretches along 105th Street through Glenville. So you have Jewish community, you have an Italian community, you have a fairly well-to-do community within the circle. Between 1900 and 1920, the population of Cleveland doubled mm -hmm. in, in that 20-year period. And Cleveland was the center of the new economy of 1900. The, the, you know, the great technology, even, even Jephthah Wade's uh, a fortune, was based on the new technology of the time, which was the telegraph. Right, right. And, and the population was exploding great wave of immigration in, in this country, people moving in, great focus on roads and, and city planning and, and uh, uh, infrastructure, and the founding within a very short period of time of, of the great cultural institutions. With an institutional base already established around Wade Park by Western Reserve College and the Case Institute, it was natural for the newer cultural institutions to also seek their homes in this area. Jephtha Wade's idea in founding Wade Park was to be a center of yep. cultural institutions. So that vision was very early established. All being based on an idea that a great new industrial power should have these great institutions to reflect the greatness of its population and its economic yeah. power. The first of the cultural institutions was the Cleveland Museum of Art. It was actually founded in 1890, but did not move to its permanent home in University Circle until 1916, 34 years after Mr. Wade selected and donated the site. I think this is one of the most beautiful places in, uh, in Cleveland, and uh, it's a beautiful front lawn for the art museum. Uh, and I remember the, uh, Peter Marzio, the director of the right. museum in Houston, coming here and looking at this setting and saying, this could be anywhere. It could be Paris. It could be any place in the, in the world. And it's, it's just so magnificent. Cleveland's goal from the very beginning was to establish a building that was truly significant, both aesthetically and in terms of its civic value. The result of the decision by the founding trustees in 1913 to commission the architectural firm of Hubble and Bennis was the design of a palace for the arts, widely acclaimed then and now as one of the finest of its time. It was, it was a time of, of, of what they called the City Beautiful movement, and it really was a, a, an idealistic time where all civic architecture referenced kind of our Greek cultural beginnings, and the museum being, being most of all referential to the, to the temple, temple architecture. And it's uh, done in a, a very spare Greek Revival, Beaux-Arts style, and it's a very, very well done building. There are a lot of subtleties to this building that I think make it work. Um, the proportions are very consistent throughout and the, uh, the marble is just allowed to express its own grain and just its own character. It's uh, thoughtfully ornamented but not overly ornamented. So you have these wonderful long clean walls of marble um, and these just little kind of pavilion uh, pediments and porticos. It's, it's a very well done building. 
The building provided an appropriate setting that was worthy of the quality of the collections donated by its founders, the most significant of whom was Jephthah Wade. And it's very difficult to overstate his importance in the founding of the museum. Uh, he really set the tone for some very important uh, things that have gone on to characterize the Cleveland Museum of Art for many years into the future. The first is that he not only donated objects, he donated money for the purchase of objects. And this set the tone for the museum to be funded through endowment and funded both for the purchase of art and for its operations. Right now, approximately 4,300 objects in the museum are in one way or another attributable to Jephthah Wade. The museum's entire collection is between 40 and 45,000 objects. So Jephthah Wade was responsible for about 10% of our collection. In addition, the objects that he donated were objects from all time periods and in all media. He donated silver, he donated uh, textiles, he donated uh, medieval objects, he donated Asian objects, he donated contemporary objects, and that set a tone for the museum as a comprehensive museum interested in the art of both the Eastern traditions and the Western traditions, something that really was actually quite rare at the time. An early focal point of the museum collection was the Armor Court, beloved by museum visitors to this day. The history of the Armor Court in the art museum is really a, uh, a part of that of that phenomenon that that, that because of the uh, the, the great uh, you know steel and metal working uh, idea that the people who founded the art museum felt that the centerpiece of that museum should be armor metal work should be a tribute to that uh, activity. Mm -hmm. The civic dimension that was envisioned by the museum's founders was carried forward 11 years later in the development of the fine arts garden designed to be almost a landscape version of the museum. The museum was uh, completed in 1916, uh, and the Fine Arts Garden, I believe, was completed around uh, 1927. Uh, yeah. 1927, 28. Yeah. And uh, the museum was constructed on a piece of land that was donated by Jephthah Wade II. The Fine Arts Garden is on a piece of land that was part of a very large gift to the city uh, that was uh, made many years earlier by Jephthah Wade II's grandfather, Jephthah Wade. Owned by the city of Cleveland, the Fine Arts Garden was designed in 1927 by the firm of Frederick Law Olmsted, creating a beautiful ensemble of museum building and landscape setting that still has few equals in this country and beyond. In being a rustic garden, many people assume that this is a natural landscape. It's anything but. The thing is a real, a very careful composition. Okay, this was the original site of the uh, boathouse, which was a feature of the uh, of the garden. It later became the um, center for the Women's Club of Cleveland, which ultimately became the botanical garden. Uh, but it was really the 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 women uh, the uh, garden club that was the driving force between the, the, the garden in the first place. And they lobbied hard uh, city officials, uh, the trustees of the museum, um, and really pulled, pulled the fundraising effort together. They were the ones who identified the Olmsted firms, and they really uh, they made this thing happen. The Fine Arts Garden is really a rustic landscape uh, framed by two formal elements, a, a lawn feature uh, in front of the museum, uh, the centerpiece of which is the uh, Zodiac Garden. It's almost a... Uh, cosmic vision of what, it, what nature can be and, and, and what it can do in society. We're surrounded by astrological signs and allegorical figures of the waters of, uh, waters of the world and the sun and the earth. It was a, uh, probably one of the, the crowning achievements of a sculptor um, named Chester Beach, a uh, New York sculptor who was identified by the firm as being able to realize um, the vision of the, of the garden as being um, a place of spiritual renewal. And at the extreme southern end is a set of formal steps to kind of stop your view uh, right at the right at the edge of, of Euclid Avenue. And at the foot of those steps is a sculpture by uh, Frank Giroux, a local uh, sculptor who was identified by the committee that um, guided all the decision making in the in the garden. The garden is used by uh, the community very heavily. The students use it every day. And what was most striking to me the first time I saw it uh, was the that it serves as a, a, a backdrop for wedding photography. 
the entire landscape that you see here today has been recontoured to achieve perfect sight lines. This whole area was dished out and then built back up around the perimeter just to frame your view of different aspects of the garden and finally as the centerpiece the art museum building. Between 1881 and 1916, many other institutions were either taking shape or were beginning to plan their moves from earlier facilities, elsewhere in Greater Cleveland, to new homes in the circle. The seeds that would eventually blossom into the Cleveland Orchestra were being sown by a remarkable woman, Adela Prentice Hughes. Adela Prentice Hughes was an accomplished musician, and she saw the need for a permanent orchestra and she created the Musical Arts Association in 1915 and she was joined by a nucleus of business and professional men to furnish and support the project. It was through her influence that Nicholas Sokoloff uh, came to Cleveland. In 1918, Sokoloff and the Musical Arts Association joined forces to create the Cleveland Orchestra. So she served as its first manager, holding the position for 15 years. During that time, the board and prominent business leaders such as John L. Severance and Dudley Blossom launched a campaign to fund the design and construction of a concert hall which would house the new orchestra. Named in memory of Elizabeth DeWitt Severance, Severance Hall embodied its founders' hopes for the young orchestra. Elizabeth Severance wife of John Long Severance, became a partner with him in the creation of the structure of, of Severance Hall. The Severance's love of music in, in part derived from music as it was used within the church. And as you look at the family's growth to wealth and prominence, they continually, whether it was at Oberlin, whether it was at Severance Hall, they invested in music and in fine art. Many have asked me, what's your favorite building in Cleveland? Without hesitation, I say Severance Hall. Why? It's actually a rather strange building because of its varied styles within one complex. But that's also what makes it so fascinating. As was very popular at the time, there's Egyptian, there's Art Deco, there's Art Modern, all of these things are sort of wrapped up in this building, each in their own space. I think one of my um, favorite experiences was collaborating with the Cleveland School of the Arts Orchestra. These young children being in this space, their eyes, you know, huge from the beauty and, and the, again, the great acoustics and getting to work with them was a really wonderful experience as well. The architects were Walker and Weeks, probably at the height of their powers. They were probably the most talented architects in the city of Cleveland for the early part of the 20th century. The, they were special because they had collected a number of designers on their team who were younger and who were full of ideas and they allowed a certain amount of expression. And I remember as a, as a student, coming up probably about once a month to see the orchestra. And I learned so much from hearing them, soloists, uh, the orchestra, working together really was a great part of my education. At exactly the same time that Adela Prentice Hughes and Nicholas Sokolov were giving birth to the Cleveland Orchestra, another future musical giant, the Cleveland Institute of Music, was founded in 1920, with the composer Ernst Bloch as its first director. Cleveland Institute of Music was founded by a group of women. The first classes that they had were in the Statler Hotel. And then they moved from there. Not surprisingly, but I think very imaginatively, they moved their operations to the mansions on Euclid Avenue. Why? Because they're the ones that had the music rooms so that they could carry on the activities they wanted. In, in those places. It was not until 1961 that the Institute of Music moved into its present home, located on East Boulevard and Juniper in University Circle. You know, what I see in that is a building th whose design is derived from its function. It holds performance, musical performance and appreciation, supreme. 
Today, the Institute serves over 400 conservatory students and 1,700 preparatory students with a faculty that includes 40 current or emeritus members of the Cleveland Orchestra. CIM conservatory students have full access to Case Western Reserve University courses and facilities, and the Institute offers many free programs, from chamber music to opera, that are open to the entire community. The Cleveland Institute of Art also had humble beginnings outside of University Circle. Founded in 1882 with just one instructor and one student, its first classes were held in the attic of the old city hall. It wasn't until 1905 that the then Cleveland Art School moved into an impressive building designed by Hubble and Bennis at Juniper and Magnolia, a key vantage point that gave art students many wonderful sights for sketching around the circle. The Institute moved into a modern building on East Boulevard when its first home was demolished to make way for a complex of university dormitories that closed off the eastern end of Magnolia Drive. In 1981, the Institute bought and renovated the historic Ford Factory Building on Euclid Avenue for much-needed studios and classrooms. The Cleveland Institute of Art has always had a major regional presence through its Cleveland School faculty, respected throughout the world for leadership and vision in all forms of visual art. Today, with over 500 students from around the world, the Institute is nationally recognized as a major force in education, in the fine arts, crafts, and applied and digital arts. Cleveland's oldest cultural institution is the Western Reserve Historical Society, founded in 1867 in the Society for Savings Building on Public Square. Cleveland's phenomenal growth sparked by the Civil War created a desire on the part of the Society's founders to preserve the region's past that was seen to be rapidly disappearing. Attracted to University Circle early on, the Society moved into new headquarters on Euclid Avenue and Fairhill Road in 1898. In 1938, the Society purchased the Hay McKinney House on East Boulevard to house its museum, and just two years later it bought the adjacent Bingham Hanna House for its library. With the construction of the Crawford Auto Aviation Museum in 1965 and an extensive library and archives addition, its Hale Farm Restoration in Bath Township, and the James A. Garfield Home and Mentor, the Western Reserve Historical Society is today the largest regional historical society of its kind in the country. A lot of folks, when they think about a natural history museum, what comes to mind is dinosaurs and certainly the Cleveland Museum of Natural History has got our share of dinosaurs including the iconic Haplocanthosaurus delphi you can call them happy but it turns out that a museum of natural history is much more than just the history of nature in recent years the Cleveland Museum of Natural History has merged with Health Space Cleveland the old health education museum and we have now folded human health into our mission We've also merged with EcoCity Cleveland, a local environmental think tank, and we now have sustainability as part of our mission. Cleveland's first natural history collections were started in the 1830s and housed in a small wooden building nicknamed the Ark on Public Square. It was in the spirit of these early scientists who gathered in the Ark that the Cleveland Museum of Natural History was founded in 1920. Its present complex of buildings on Wade Oval began in the 1950s and is presently being expanded. And it's very, very exciting as we look forward is to integrating traditional natural sciences along with human health, environmental health, along with that sense of how can we live sustainably in the future so that we can be good stewards of this planet and its resources. Over the years, the world-renowned staff of researchers and educators has made significant, world-changing scientific discoveries and has taught millions to appreciate the natural environment through the museum's displays and programs while collecting more than a million specimens used for research and display. Jephthah Wade traveled far and wide collecting special things, things which he ultimately gave to the city. And amongst those are a very, very interesting collection of gemstones. A collection that was amassed over some time was donated to the fledgling Cleveland Museum of Natural History in 1924. Uh, many of the pieces were evaluated by Tiffany's in New York City, and they are the basis of an exhibit, a permanent exhibit, in the Jephthah Homer Wade II Gallery of Gems and Jewels. It's a tremendous legacy of the Wade family, a gift that keeps giving to the city time and time again.
Botanical Garden of Cleveland has its roots in earlier women's organizations focused on sparking, quote, a passion for plants and cultivating an understanding of their vital relationship to people and the environment. It was formerly known as the uh, Garden Center of Greater Cleveland, and it was the country's oldest uh, uh, garden center. Uh, it was established in 1930. And it was originally, actually, began within the university area because it was a part of um, the Wade Park uh, Lagoon. The boathouse on the lagoon served as the first home of what was then known as the Garden Club of Cleveland. As its scope of activities expanded, the club moved to a site on the East Boulevard end of Wade Oval. They appointed a woman named Margaret Asborn, who was a graduate of the Lothrop uh, School of Landscape Architecture. She was the center's first director, and it was, the institution was reorganized at that time, and that's how it became the Garden Center of Greater Cleveland, and, but it ended the sponsorship by the Garden Club. Renamed the Cleveland Botanical Garden in 1994, it has expanded into a dynamic regional center for horticultural education and research with a recently built dramatic glass house that contains a tropical rainforest environment, typical of Costa Rica, and a desert environment unique to the island of Madagascar. As we all know, the University Circle is a tremendous learning center with so many institutions to draw upon for ex experiential learning, learning through experience. And when I was attending a board retreat at Hawkins School, we were asking ourselves, how can we take our children to a higher learning level? And we thought, through experiential learning. And so what we did was we said, where can we get the best experience for our students? And it was University Circle. Hawkins School and the Montessori High School have each established education centers on Magnolia Drive from which their students can experience a rich diversity of learning opportunities in other circle institutions and in the surrounding communities. Hawken has completely renovated the Mather House, while the Montessori School has refurbished three former homes on the block. The main classroom building is in the imposing Straw Russell Mansion designed by Charles Swineforth. I think it's a fabulous idea. It'll be a catalyst to the neighborhood because if people want to move down here, they figure, oh, there's no high school. Well, you're here. There's a high school, and you, they've done a beautiful job. I mean, they've retained the house. I mean, I think it's fabulous. Hawkins School started in University Circle by James A. Hawkins, and it was, it was started by a group of women. So we are bringing Hawkins back to University Circle, back to our roots, and emphasizing the principles of James A. Hawkins. And we're using all of our, our institutions. We're colla our collaboration partnerships are vast throughout the circle. Art adorns the circle in many places and in many ways. It helps to enhance its claim to be a special place, originally transformed from forests and farmland into an urban park-like setting for institutions of culture, learning, and spirituality. But these unique qualities have always been a source of tension and potential conflict within the circle itself and with the surrounding communities. Sometimes we've been balanced in our growth in the university circle between our institutions and our residents, and sometimes I think we've been out of balance. The period between 1850 and 1950, we were in balance, a healthy mix of our institutions and residents that made this vibrant urban place. Um, the story of African Americans with the university circle is a story of population and migration has to do with the, the um, dyna racial dynamics of the city of Cleveland and the um, sort of boundaries that kept being passed over. The Glenville community, which was 90 percent Jewish in 1930, became 90 percent African American by 1950. Urban sprawl hit. A lot of racial tension in our neighborhoods around us. People moving out, moving on, post-World War II bungalow housing all over Northeast Ohio being built. People fled the city. They left those behind who 
necessarily couldn't find their way to the suburban environment that had mushroomed in the Cleveland area around the 1950s. By the 1950s, when we had this 90% African American population, we still have to look at some of those boundaries and, and realize that um, the university circle community was still pretty much a, a, uh, on the other side of the boundary. That's what we have to think about. When Mount Zion Church in 1954 purchased property on Magnolia Drive, there was a great hue and cry from the people in the university circle that this was going to certainly ruin the neighborhood. Because of its legacy as an urban parkland, a cultural and educational island, a residential haven for the wealthy, and a medical mecca, Clevelanders have always viewed University Circle as a place apart, a city unto itself, not connected to or intertwined with the adjoining neighborhoods. Generally, the institutions in the Circle have historically mirrored this point of view. Our organization, UCI, was founded in 1957, really when it was apparent that sprawl was hitting hard. Uh, we were founded to help assure the growth and vitality of our institutions. Uh, we were set up actually as a land bank at first to buy land for the strategic reinvestment and growth opportunity of our institutions. And to one degree, we were extremely successful. We built this competitive, world-class place of education, medical, and arts institutions. But to another degree, we probably admittedly over-institutionalized. I knew that there were many people who went to classes at the art museum, for example. They were little children, though, and of course the schools at that time used to bus, um, the city schools bus children into, into uh, the university circles. However, when you wandered in off the street, as I did with children, there was a different attitude, <laughs> so that I felt unwelcome in the art museum in some of those institutions. Although I was experienced at being a museum goer, I had grown up in museums in New York. <laughs> so what emerged was a relatively well-to-do enclave of relatively well-to-do institutions. But the paradox of place really is that what emerged, a healthy institutional base in a great cultural district, was surrounded by a sea of urban poverty. And um, I made it a mission to expand the services of the art museum to the community in which it resided by then, the Glenville community, because uh, the, around, the, around the University Circle was a growing black community. Fast forward 20, 30 years, I became the first African American to be appointed to the Board of Trustees at the Art Museum. Today our institutions are taking a different position. I think they realize a higher stewardship responsibility to the neighborhoods around them. Our anchor institutions are reaching out in partnership to our neighborhoods, welcoming residents in, helping with workforce development. Our foundations, the Cleveland Foundation, have been instrumental in workforce development in the neighborhoods around us. It's a new day in University Circle because we've opened our doors and created a neighborhood really without borders. I think that there's a real opportunity to reach out to the surrounding community and University Circle has started to have success in making some positive changes and strengthen the bonds that it has to really use its, the leverage itself and the successes that it's had in the recent past to bring that success into the neighboring community. I think it's important that as University Circle continues to grow and prosper and expand that the community, the surrounding community, uh, be a part of that process. And so I think if the surrounding community, that much of which is de depressed, can connect with what's going on in University Circle, it will make a, a better and a broader uh, impact on the greater Cleveland community. And so we have a shift in uh, idea about who was to be served by those institutions and realizing that they cannot be sustained by a very narrow, small, white population. With the major medical institutions uh, that are a part of University Circle and contiguous to it, we know that there's, and Cleveland Clinic now being the largest employer uh, in this region, there are opportunities for people to get 
proper training and to assume employment at these various institutions. And we want to make sure and we are very hopeful that there will be a connection and a partnership that takes place where the community is, is made aware of the opportunities that are available and given the opportunity to apply for jobs and positions at those various institutions. We think that's critical. What I'm trying to say is we've made a complete turn. We're no longer turning our backs from our neighborhoods. We've integrated ourselves into our neighborhoods in every way that is positive. University Circle is attempting to make its surrounding neighborhoods thrive and hopefully flourish by helping them to establish stronger support networks. While University Circle is just but one neighborhood in Cleveland, it really has all the qualities of a small city in a nutshell. The diversity of the people, of the economics, and of the uses that you can find here. How I experienced University Circle as a child coming to the different museums and institutions is wildly different than it is today and the experiences I have today as I bring my son to go to the music school settlement for music lessons. And I know that what he will see when he's an adult, an adult is going to be completely different from that. But because of University Circle's steady and strong growth in the last 100 years, I know that he'll have just as wonderful of an experience as I have. When I think of University Circle today, I marvel at the changes that have occurred, not just in my lifetime, but in the last 150 years or so, from its inception as a bucolic farmland to its new position as a powerhouse in the 21st century for medical, cultural, and educational innovations, and its place in not only the region as a front runner, but in the world but we are now really hitting our stride after those 150 years. I mean, this was an incredible vision of our city forefathers and mothers uh, to bring together this confluence of education, medical, and arts and cultural institutions over the last century and a half. What this place, this whole area really represents is the expression of the founding fathers of Cleveland's dream of lifting it above being merely a factory town. The position of University Circle is more crucial to the, to the future of Cleveland uh, than, than ever before as we've moved from a, an economy based on brawn to one based on brains. University Circle has attained the uh, prime position in the city's future. But what we were a century ago was a great urban neighborhood. The people who remember back University Circle 50, 60, 70 years ago remember a place that was vibrant, that was vital, that had, you know, street life along Euclid Avenue where trolley cars were king, Vaudevillian Theater was down the street, we had a department store, you know. People remember this as the place to be uptown where they could go out and have a night out with a great restaurant, and, you know, go see a jazz show. Nowadays there's a movement and it really has happened in the last uh, decade or so, maybe even a little bit before that, of really creating a sense of place making it back into a neighborhood. Philanthropy and University Circle started many, many years ago largely by prominent families, wealthy families, who wanted to create an environment that would enrich lives of people. And philanthropy in itself is a catalyst for change. So these people wanted to enhance their environment. They were wealthy, they wanted quality of life, and they wanted, they wanted to educate their children, they wanted uh, social programs for children less fortunate than theirs. They wanted arts and humanities programs. They wanted many things to add to the quality of life of all the people of Cleveland. So he had these marvelous families who felt so strongly about the future of Cleveland and, and wanting it to be a wonderful place for people to live that they started investing in institutions. Cleveland is very, very lucky to have this, this enormous uh, campus here. I don't know of any other place anywhere here or in Europe that, that, that uh, rivals it as a campus of so many uh, different interests, so many different intellectual and artistic interests. 
the Temple to Fareth Israel on East 105th Street, which lies just on the margins of the circle, is going to become a new home for performing arts at Case Western Reserve. The space is incredibly beautiful, historically significant, and perfectly suited to house the departments of theater, music, and dance at the university. The university's breathtaking project at the landmark Jewish temple is just one example of the type of forward thinking being generated within Circle institutions and its surrounding communities. Another is the Museum of Contemporary Art of Cleveland, anchoring several blocks of new retail and residential development surrounding the intersection of Mayfield and Euclid Avenues. So our best days, we think, are still ahead of us in University Circle, where we can recreate a neighborhood, make it an even more uh, um, great neighborhood than it's ever been before. More and more people will start to live within the circle itself. Many other American cities have similarly great institutions, art museums, universities, hospitals, orchestras, and so forth. The founding fathers of, of Cleveland had the wisdom to put all of these great institutions in one spot on the same campus. And that was a, an indication that they believed strongly in the spirit of partnership. They believed that putting these places together would magnify their excellence. And as we look to the future, we're excited about the partnerships that we formed with our colleagues here in University Circle. We have partnerships with the Museum of Art and the Natural History Museum, the Western Reserve Historical Society, the Botanical Garden, the Cleveland Institute of Music, the Cleveland Institute of Art. We work with the music school settlement. There's almost not an organization in University Circle that somehow we don't have a connection with one way or another. Today we're seeing a return to a spirit of partnership, which is absolutely necessary if University Circle is going to become the true brain center of Cleveland and the engine for the future.